This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, now I have to once again make an unnecessary introduction. Um, our first speaker, of course, is one of our organizers, Lucia Carbone. She has her PhD from uh, Columbia University, but far more importantly, she's an alumna of the 2012 ANS Summer Seminar, Summer Seminar and now serves as Assistant Curator of Roman Coins at the ANS. Her primary uh, field of interest uh, is the transition from Hellenistic to Roman rule in Asia Minor, and we can see that uh, in evidence in her very recent 2020 monograph, uh, Hidden Power, which you can go online right now and order from the ANS uh, <laughs> website um, and if you don't have a copy you should do that immediately if this conference is <laughs> thank you ben. That would be. <laughs> um, and that uh, that that treats the uh, the 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 late Sistofri in in the context of the mithridatic wars um partly on the basis of a a, a massive horde um she's written articles also on the monetary system of the province of asia the publicani the coinage of mark antony and she's now producing a complete catalog of the collection donated by Rick to the ANS in 2015. Today, she is going to speak to us uh, with a title that Rick would have much approved of. Exactly, the point exactly. Is solved, the contribution <laughs> yeah, of, of the Chunky collection. I mean, I, I would say that is a little bit uh, ambitious of me, okay, to, to say solved. But yes, of course, uh, you, you got the Rick reference. So I will begin now. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I will begin now to share my screen. And here it is. And uh, OK, slideshow and click from the start. So here it is, exactly. Um, in his important essay, once again, this is not a surprise, and of course you will all uh, find and notice uh, the reference. So in his important essay on the coinage of Aristonicus Rebellion, ESG Robinson famously lamented not only the questionable lack of aesthetic quality of the systophoric coinage, but also, perhaps more relevantly to the aim of this paper, the fact that its importance for a better understanding of the history of the Attali Kingdom, later Provincia Asia, had been undervalued. However, in the decades after Robinson's statement, systophoric coinage has been the object of a thorough study. I mean, again, uh, uh, of course, all the Kleiner's article, of course, we're talking about early systophoric coinage book, uh, uh, which came out by Sydney, uh, by um, uh, Fred Kleiner in Sydney, uh, Noe, and of course, all Metcalf work, uh, and uh, of course, uh, Francois and Andy's work, and so and so, so I mean, and also my monograph, but um, there is much that has been done. Now, um, Rick Wichonk and his collection of over 800 systophory have been of fundamental importance to these advancements in knowledge, knowledge and, and my own, I have to say, personal academic career. In the course of the 2012 ANS Summer Seminar, Rick and Andy, Andy, you have some responsibility here, introduced me to this coinage. And I became fascinated by the relationship between the early stages of Roman provincial power and these Hellenistic looking coins. In the course of the same summer, I stumbled across Francois's article more than it would seem, the use of coinage by the Romans in the late Hellenistic Asia Minor. The topic of my dissertation and on my first, hopefully, uh, monograph was decided then. In this paper, I will focus on the systophoric novelties offered by the Wichonke collection in terms of previously unknown varieties and of, as of yet, unstudied mints. This is okay. So let's begin with this. In 2006, uh, Colin Pitchfork published in the JNA uh, an article on two recently discovered systophoric hordes composed respectively of 1,700 and 1,300 coins. 
and dated to 1332 BC and 989 BC. The second of these hordes, the one dated to 90 BC, and now the, uh, has been published in my monograph, uh, The Hidden Power. The first one, which I will call from this moment on 2000 horde, however, still awaits proper publication, but some specimens uh, are now included on in the Wichonke conference. Uh, sorry, in the Wichonke collection. They include 31 previously unknown varieties, mostly they're linked to ones to the ones already included in the early Cystophoric coinage, which I will call from this moment on ECC by Kleiner and Noe. Only six new obverse dyes have been found, a tribute to the thoroughness of the study pursued by Kleiner and Noe. The breakdown of the issues of the different mints uh, included in this 2000 hoard is presented in this slide that you can see. I will now present you the new varieties, the new varieties of early Cystophory, which are, that are present in these, uh, the were present in this 2000 horde and are now at ANS. I will only focus on specific of specific issues that are important for historical reasons, but I wanted here to give you a sort of overview. So this is Pergamon, and please notice all the dye links to the previous series. So there is no doubt about their chronological placement. And for example, I chose one of these, but one of the new series in the 2000 horde of Pergamon for no specific reason in this case. In other cases, of course, there are very specific reasons. The, here we have, uh, have Ephesus, for example. And here I thought that was very interesting to showcase this specific new issue, which is a dated issue from Ephesus. Of course, we have other uh, coins uh, that are um, dated to the year Alpha Kappa, so 21, 139, 138 uh, BC, but uh, this one has a star, and we will talk more about this. So I will explain, of course, more for the ones which are not so uh, accustomed with Cystophoric uh, uh, coinage what these dates are about. And then we have Trulles. Uh, for Trulles, we have, there were some issues uh, uh, included in this hoard, which are now at part of the Richonke uh, collection, that are super important because they present these initials. So the coins discovered in this hoard have allowed Richard Ashton to prove that the mint of Trulles in Lydia placed the names of Macedonian months on its coinage at a certain point in the course of the second century BC. His conclusions, uh, his conclusions are confirmed by this coin, a specimen once again included in the hoard. Here you can see on the reverse uh, clearly the, uh, the letters Upsilon P Uperberetaios, so the Macedonian month of September, October, that are cut over the original letters Gor, Gorpaios. You can see here the Macedonian month of August and September. Okay. The coin presented in this other slide, also part of the same hoard, has on its reverse the letters Omicron Lambda, so for Oloios, the Macedonian month of July and August, probably recut over uh, Delta Alpha or Delta Alpha Iota, so Dicius, June or July. So the Uchonke collection includes a total of 14 trillion specimens with abbreviated Macedonian months, which further confirms our Ashton identification by adding the month of Artemisios, so April and May, as you can clearly see on these cystophoric drums, drum, and Panemos here, 
Panemos, so June and July. And here, once again, you can clearly see that the P alpha has been recut on what possibly is a delta alpha, so uh, Dicios. Moreover, the presence of these issues in almost uncirculated condition in the 2000 horde, which, as we said, has been dated to 133 BC, suggests a date in the years for these issues, in the years immediately preceding the revolt of Aristonicus, Aristonicus, which is to say 10 years after the date originally proposed by ECC, by Kleiner and Noe. And now we have Apamea, the early systophilic mint of Apamea. You can clearly see here that a lot of new varieties have, have been added by, um, by this, uh, this uh, hoard and actually by the Wichonke collection that includes some of these specimens that are in some cases absolutely, um, absolutely unique. Now, I will check here. So among the new Apamean varieties included in the 2000 uh, horde, the series, uh, sorry, I will go back. This series here, so uh, Tau, Yota, and Flute, presents several elements of interest. In ECC, the early systophoric coinage, Kleiner and Noe convincingly argued, as we already said, that the letters Kappa, Alpha Kappa, Alpha Beta, which appears above the reverse type on the Refusion Tetradarm series uh, 33 to 36, uh, or the letters Alpha Gamma and Delta, which occurs in the same position on Apamean Tetradarm series 26 28, are regnal dates of Attalus II and Attalus III. I have here, of course, this is uh, for the year. 2021, 20, uh, so the year 21 of the reign of Attalus II. Here you can see the year uh, first of Attalus III, and you can clearly see, of course, the K here, the Kappa here, which has been erased. Here you have, for example, Apamea. Now, um, in a 2000, in an article of 2004, Richard Ashton suggests that more dated issues could be identified. In the specific, as I was saying, the uh, tau, uh, the theta iota on the reverse of the coin in this slide could be interpreted as a regnal year 19, placing this issue in 141, 140 BC. If further regnal years are to be added to the ones recorded by uh, early systophoric coinage, certainly this one, which you can clearly see, so Epsilon Yota on the reverse of the Apamean series 29 could be read as regnal year 15, so 145, 4 BC. So once again, 10 years earlier, than the date assigned to the series by Kleiner and Noe. Since series 29 and 30, of which I will talk in a moment, share an obverse dice, this means that both series need to be antedated to the mid-140 BC. And now comes the specific contribution brought that by the Wichonke collection. So, a specific, a unique specimen included in the Wichonke collection, characterized by the specific ethnic here that you can see, and dolphin, this is, as I say, absolutely unique on the reverse, seem to confirm the dating suggested by Ashton. The only previously known Cystophorus with this ethnic had different symbols. This is the Cystophorus that unfortunately we don't have at ANS. You can see the same ethnic, but you can see that the symbols, the control marks are different because here you have a club, club and a pelt, and you see here Epsilon Gamma Iota in uh, one of the coils, in the right coil. And this is dial linked to ACC Series 30, as I said, which has same obverse die, same symbols, and uh, um, same symbols here, even if, as you can see here, the name 
the name, the, the letters anyway, uh, here are on, a, on the other coil, on the right coil instead of being on the left. And you can clearly see here that the ethnic is different. Now, um, Kleiner argued that these this unique, basically, this almost unique ethnic should be interpreted as Perga and derived from the recut of the original monogram uh, Apa, so the ethnic of Apamea. This would provide further proof of the fact that the Apamean early history were actually minted in Pergamon. On the other hand, Richard Ashton resolved the monogram as Apamean, since the verse die associated with the reverse, with this reverse and this ethnic, went on being used were far too serious in Apamea. Anyway, according to Ashton convincing argument, the Sistophorus of the Wuchonke collection with these, I mean, with this specific ethnic should then be dated to the mid 140s BC together with the Apamean ACC series 29 and 30. So, if this proposal to move this series to the mid 140 BC were to be accepted, the relative order of the early Sistophoric uh, series of Apamea would be completely changed. And this is how it will look like. So basically the contribution really of the Wichonke collection through this uh, unique specimen changes in some way uh, all the part of the chronology, a huge part of the chronology of the early Sistophoric coinage of Apamea. I'll just go on quickly to these ones by Sardis. And I say Sardis because as we know, we have all the problems that there are several monograms for Sardis that have been interpreted as Sardis in Nada, we're not sure. But anyway, so the coins, um, we have then the ethnic of the coins uh, presented in this slide, which is this one here, has been hypothetically identified as Dios Hieron by Georges Leride. We know that we're not sure about this, but this is an hypothesis. The existence of, and this is a new uh, issue, exactly, a new variety of this specific one, of this specific for the present of Ba here, of bet, uh, Beta Alpha. But uh, the existence of Sistophory issued in the name of the Phrygian city of Dios, Dios Yaron seems to be confirmed by another specimen in the INS collection where the name of the city is spelled in its entirety. And here really I'm asking uh, for your ideas on this, but because this is another unique specimen, in this case, not in uh, uh, Rick's collection, but in the ANS one, but anyway. So I will now go and begin the next part of my talk, which is about late Sistophory. The Wichonke collection includes over 231 late Sistophory carefully chosen for their historical interest. Late Sistophory are all the Sistophory issued after 128 BC, independently of their stylistic peculiarities. Specimens included in this collection allow us to establish the starting date of the Sistophoric production of Nisa and Laodicea and the production patterns of the means of Smyrna and Sardis. And a dye study of the late Sistophory of Laodicea was also pursued together with Gregory Callaghan, building on the Laodicean specimens included in this collection. The inclusion of a Sistophorus in mint condition in the 2002 hoard dated to 1989 BC changes the chronology of the Nissan, the, the Nissan series, as I said. The dating era of the Nissan Sistophory had been identified by Wolfgang, Wolfgang Leshorn, followed by William Metcalf, with the Siulan era, starting immediately after the Peace of Dardanus in 85-4 BC. According to Metcalf, who published a dye study of Nissan Sistophory, these coins dated from year alpha, so one, to uh, Kappa da, uh, Delta 24, were issued between 85-4 and 62-1 BC. 
the new evidence provided by the world and by the Wuchonke collection allow us to date year one earlier to 1989 BC, which then establishes an end date for year 24 in 67 6 BC, so close to the end date of the Ephesian late Cystophoric series. The beginning of the cystophoric production of Nisa is done in line with those of the means of Apamea, which were also included in this 2000, uh, 2002 hoard, dated to 90. Well, we know that Kleiner thought that Apamea began its production in 88, and Laodicea, so at the same time and also fits perfectly into the generalized spike in monetary production connected to the beginning of the first Mithridatic War, of which Francois has already, has already talked about. And here are just some other data uh, which are provided by this horde, this 2002 horde, which I, which I uh, published, but you can clearly see here the increase, for example, in Pergamon production, in Ephesus production, as you can see, and in Tralles production. Moving on here, um, a comparison between the dye of a Smyrna specimen in the Wuchonke collection with another specimen previously belonging to Newell, included in the ANS collection and dated to the same year, so year beta, as you say, two, probably 98-7 BC, and I, we can explain later if you're interested why I'm dating it to this age, to this uh, year, shows that there were at least two dice and two different monograms for the same year for this city. This might suggest that the systophoric production of the city of Smyrna was not as limited as previously thought and suggested by the rarity of these specimens. Then, the three specimens of Sardian late cystophory included in the Wuchonke collection show that the cystophoric production of the city continued at least for at least 20 years. Two of these specimens are dated to the year Iota Theta, so 19, and share the same obverse ties. I'm showing you one of them. And the specimen dated to the year Kappa, so 20, as a different obverse dyes and suggests that Sardis production consumed at least, for what we can know now, one obverse tetradam obverse dye per year. And once again, these are considered on the contrary incredibly rare uh, cystophory. I will now proceed to the last part of this talk. So the late cystophory of Laodicea. Laodicea was one of the athlete cystophoric means as one of the assize district centers of Provincia Asia, and later on of Kilikia, the city issued both late and later Republican Cystophory. The present study represents a further contribution to the, to the understanding of Laodicean Cystophoric production pattern through a dye study of its late Cystophory. The present study is based on a sample of 242 specimens, of which 52 are included in the Wichonke collection. The issues will be ordered according to the chronological order provisionally provided by Hort evidence. In the absence of dye links, the issues within the same time frame have been ordered alphabetically. So the late cystophory of Ladisea have a slightly different appearance from earlier issues. While they maintain the same obverse type, the reverse features the ethnic uh, Lao, as you see in the left field, in contrast with loud on earlier issues. Moreover, while the early cystophory have different symbols on the right field of the reverse, the late ones always feature a filleted caduceus, as you can see here. Uh, another novelty is the presence of a monogram between the snake heads on some issues, uh, other have the nominative or the genitive of the name of the signers or his name in full, including the patronymic on the individual responsible for the monetary production. 22 issues have been identified in the course of this study. Now, out of the six hordes containing Laodicean late cystophory that were deposited in the course of the first half of the first century BC, four are important for dating issues the 2002 horde, and sorry, I mean, 
uh, I see that here is misplaced, the 2002 hoard, which we have already talked, where we have five specimens of this specific series with this uh, uh, monogram here, which suggests that the cystophoric production of Laodicea, like that of Avami, as we said, must have begun right before the deposition of the hoard. And the ant, so this specific uh, um, monogram series, was the first Laodicean late cystophoric tissue produced. The Caracas Bay hoard, which is very important for dating uh, reason, uh, contains only one specimen of the series Hermogenes Olympiodoro. By the way, um, it's very interesting to see that on, in Laodicea, we have really an alternance between the lunate sigma and the normal sigma, as we have also a presence of the lunate omega and the normal omega that went, goes back and forth between the issues. I will now go and um, proceed to the, this hoard, so coin hoard 9.560. This hoard is extremely interesting for the high number of cystophory of Laodicea, which are rarely attested in other hoards, and for the significant absence of pergamine and efficient late cystophory. In the absence of efficient cystophory, the dating provided by Constantin Marinescu, who is the first one who published this hoard, is based on the presence of 18 of the 22 varieties of apami and late cystophory identified by Kleiner. Since the apami and late cystophoric issues are dated between 90s, between circa 90 and the 60s BC, the burial date of the world should be placed close to the end of the sequence of these issues, which is to say around 70 BC. The inclusion of 140 late cystophoric specimen of Laodicea makes it highly unlikely that any issues of this mint not present in the hoard were in circulation by the time of its deposit. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that any types not included in this hoard were minted after 72-70 BC. This other hoard, this has been also discussed by Andy, so coin hoard 8.526, uh, dated uh, around after 58, 57 BC, is important because includes four specimens of the series, this series, Zeuxis Apollonio Tuamintu, which was not included in uh, the previous hoard. So this means that there was, this means that there was only one more issue apparently that was uh, um, that was issued after the closing of the previous hoard. Um, so uh, two extremely rare issues are not included in the, any hoard, but because of their rarity, their absence cannot provide any further dating. Lacy production in Laodicea thus must have come to an end between the date of the deposition, of course, of 72 BC and possibly the beginning of the 60s. As, as we said, only one new issue was produced in the decade 70, 60 BC. Now, the dye study. Sorry for all of this, as you see, but the dye study, I wanted just to show you that the dye study pursued so far suggests a high reliability of the sample considered. The production pattern allied so far, together with old evidence already mentioned, seems to suggest, as we said, the Laodicean late cystophoric production was concentrated within 20 years between the very late 90s and the very late, the very um, late uh, 70s BC, in a way to in a similar way to the concentrated production hypothesized by Kleiner for Apamea. I just want to mention, briefly mention these brokages. So adding to Francois, um, uh, to Francois uh, um, catalog, let's say of brokages here. And uh, you can see, you can see this one and uh, much more relevant and we already discussed this this one, they are for the same signer, Olympiodorus uh, uh, Hermogenu, that according to the dye study should be uh, dated exactly between 70, uh, the end basically like 75, 72 
VC, but you can see here the counter, what is to me a counter brokerage because you can see exactly both the types and you see the enqueues basically the of the um, of the uh, reverse uh, the, the reverse uh, type. Anyway, now um, even uh, um, so. In his 2011 article, more than it would seem, and now, François de Calatay discussed the existence of systophoric brokerages and interpreted them as a sign of Romanitas, since brokerages are far more common in Roman Republican coinage. We have already discussed this. Independently of the relationship to Roman power, it seems certain that repeated brokerages in coinages were mostly absent, um, there are, where they are mostly absent, suggest a haste in production, probably to put in correlation with spike in systophoric production, which you have seen would be make perfect sense for Laodicea, actually. I have the data for this now and will make perfect sense because, of course, it's perfectly in relation, uh, uh, then synchronized with Ephesus and, uh, as Francois said, and Tralles. Anyway, um, now, what is very important is that in spite of the questions that still need to be properly answered, the present study of the late Sistophory of Laodicea enable us to outline the production patterns of this mint in the course of the second first century BC. According to early Sistophoric coinage by Kleiner and Noe, the total early Sistophoric production of the city amounted to less than 1% of the total early Sistophoric production of the kingdom. The present study of the Laodicean late Sistophory, combined with the analogous study of the late Sistophory of Tralles and world data deriving from Sistophoric means buried between 133 and 50 BC, which I discussed in my monograph, show a consistent increase in the production of Laodicea, which I can see now it be, uh, climbs from 1% to 7%. And here is even more evident. Okay, this is in observed at Ram's dice. You see the late Sistophory here. Now, um, according to Metcalf data, who studied the later Sistophory of the city, Laodicea became the second mint in order of importance, close to Pergamon and immediately following uh, Apamea. Of course, there are possibly several reasons for this, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, reason, for this increase. But anyway, in the century between the end of Laodicea early Sistophoric production and the end of later Republican Sistophory, the Laodicean representation soared from 1% to 22% of the total. Now, the present study shows that the increase in relative importance of the Laodicean mint had already begun at the very beginning of the first century BC, consistently with the last and the important growing importance of Roman Phrygia, as Tonneman, of course, has told us. But to finish, to conclude, the new data for late systophoric production of Laodicea allow us to fine tune the calculation of systophoric production for the whole province. The following table contains calculation based on the systophoric production of Tralles combined with word data. This was in my, um, in my monograph, but what is super interesting is here. This is the number 56.27 total of tether runs as estimated according to ST for the mint of Laodicea. And the present study uh, calculates a production of 58 tether run obverse dice. So which means uh, that uh, is a figure which is only sli uh, sli uh, slightly higher and well between the high low estimate range. The study of the Laodicean uh, Sistophory does contributes to a better knowledge of the production pattern of this important Sistophoric mint, confirms the growing importance of Phrygian Sistophoric mints in the course of the first century BC, and especially of Laodicea, and confirms the methodology adopted in previous studies to estimate the Sistophoric production of the province of Asia from the combination of data deriving from hoard and die studies. The Wichonka collection of Sistophory pro proves thus fundamental to the better understanding of the Sistophory production pattern in the Attali Kingdom and in the Provincia Asia, 
Since, as I've argued in previous publication, the Sistoporus was the only silver coinage uh, uh, circulating at large in, this province, uh, in the province of Asia, the specimens included in this collection prove instrumental in understanding monetary system of one of the richest, up to a certain point, provinces of the Roman Empire. Thank you very much, Lucia. I think uh, you've demonstrated a number of things there, but I think uh, for, first and foremost, you've identified the uh, the extraordinary strength of um, both Rick's collection, um, mm -hmm. but also, and, uh, and 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 it's no coincidence, of course, his his deep engagement with the material, such that he recognised the interesting things uh, and acquired them, the, the, a deep knowledge. Um, going hand in hand with uh, uh, an interest in assembling this material. And it's wonderful, of course, that this is now in the ANS and has a curator who is so deeply involved in its exegesis. Uh, there are no questions in the Q&A yet, so get typing, people. Um, but I will start with, I, I guess, um, a, a two-part question, um, if that's fair. The first about the, the earlier period the, um, mm -hmm. um, that you, you began by talking about and the readjustments and the new issues um, that, that you've got there. So first question would be, does this materially affect the, the, the structure of this coinage in terms of its um, size at various points? At the moment, if we take Kleiner and Noe's chronology for the, uh, for, the, mm -hmm. for the royal issues, we have a very intense early period of production Mm -hmm. a really quite light period down to the Aristonicus revolt. And then we have exactly. a massive series of, of productions there. Have you, have you smoothed that somewhat or is, or is this actually just, just, just minor changes? No, in reality, this means uh, uh, these, these changes that I think now I would say, thanks to the good collection, I think we can prove, means that there is a spike in, in the production in uh, the 140s. So we have uh, not, uh, uh, so uh, we know clearly that during, that's difference, that during the, the, Aristonic, uh, the Aristonicus uh, uh, rebellion, we do have, of course, an increase in systophoric production. But what I think that now we can prove is that the previous spike in production is to be placed uh, uh, between 145 and 140s instead of, uh, of exactly in the years immediately before Aristonicus rebellion, which is very interesting. So it's basically the, uh, the important uh, years are the last years then, which also makes, uh, I don't know, some sense if I think with the read of that, read the tetradams. So really we have, I would say, a really a reorganization of the production patterns on the early systophoric coinages. Yes. And uh, yeah, this is, I think, the gist of uh, what otherwise would be a very technical discussion, but this is uh, pretty important for historical reasons. Yes, thank you. That, that's very interesting, as you say, particularly in the context of the wreathed coinages, which yes. uh, are otherwise uh, seem seem to be spiking at that point, and we're left having to explain a, a really rock, remarkable increase in coin production in a period we would otherwise describe as peaceful, I suppose, in this part of the world in the 150s and the 140s. Mm -hmm. um, that may be something we want to ponder a little. That leads me into the second part of my question. I'm still not seeing nothing in the uh, the Q and A window. So I will, I will. Sorry, I mean, I must be, it is a terrible, I mean, perhaps it was too technical. This stuff really scared people away. I'm sorry. Well, we've got, well, no, no, Noah's, Noah's waiting in now. So, but I'm, I'm going to get in a quick one before that, which is about the, the, the second period and the, the chronology that you've beautifully elucidated now for these, these late issues at, uh, at Laodicea and Appleman in particular. Are we to assume, therefore, that these are too big to be civic? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh my God. As you know, thank you, Andy. I know that you were calling me. This is the second time. Uh, you know that, and it's exactly what that's what I wanted to ask Francois. I mean, what we think for Roman and Roman influence. I mean, who is actually paying for this? I mean, do we believe in the bullion or something like that? Because exactly, I I 
Now, um, <laughs> this is huge. I would say that uh, um, it's much more interesting for me uh, to answer this question, not talking about the spike uh, right before the beginning of the Mithridatic Wars, because otherwise uh, you would think it has to do, of course, I don't know, the Romans uh, and so and so. But what is very interesting for me is that we have another spike. So we have a spike in right before the first Mithridatic War. But then we have a huge spike in production right after the end of the first Mithridatic War. So right after Dardanus. And there, there are no Roman armies there. I mean, at least, I mean, there are some Roman armies, but there is no war going on, at least for a little bit. And we know on the contrary that Asian cities were fined, terribly fined, for exactly with 20,000 talents fine. I mean, which according to my calculation really corresponded to the whole amount of uh, numerary of coinage circulating in provincial Asia. Of course, they were not paid in in coinage, whatever, but just to see how enormous this was. Now, it would not make so much sense to me to imagine that the Romans were providing bullion to these cities so they could pay for their fine. And we know, so in reality, so it is a very difficult balance. I would say that this history clearly served as provincial coinage, but clearly there was a huge involvement on the civic side, which is not to say that in specific moments, like perhaps the beginning of the, civic, of the Mithridatic Wars, the Romans contributed. But I would say that on the contrary, since there is, a, um, I would say a proven uh, connection between exactly high taxation of the civic of these cities, bankruptcy of these cities, and over strikes of these cities um, with systophoric production. So we can have to imagine necessarily that the, the city, cities had to pay at least for a huge part of this. And last, one last thing is that otherwise, uh, if we were to imagine that the Romans were the one providing bullion for the late systophoric coinage, it would not make sense to make a connection between, I don't know, the bankruptcy of Ephesus and the end of the late systophoric coinages, for example. And we see now with that Nisa was probably the same. Personally, I think Tralles was uh, plus or minus around that same age, perhaps not uh, the same years. So really we have, and then after that, uh, and once again, and sorry if I'm talking too much, we have uh, almost uh, 10 years uh, without any systophory, any denarii circulating. And then we have, uh, and this is, I, I talk about it in another article that should come up soon, but then we have the overbid of the Publicani in 20, in 61 BC saying basically that it, it, the, the cities were too poor. And we know that Caesar said that the cities of Asia were not able to pay taxes for five years. So it is once again difficult to imagine that if the Romans are the one for the bullion, paying the bullion, then why there are no systophory? Since we know that the cities are bankrupted, but then if the systophory are just minted with somebody else bullion, why should they just go on? minting them. So anyway, this is my idea. So thank you. So th this, th this all speaks to, to a question that's just popped up from, from, from Warren Esty, I think. And at, at this point, I'll, I'll invite Francois, if he's, if he's there and wants to, wants to chip in, since this, this applies, I think, to, to a certain degree. To, to yes, oh. but, 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 but just to remind that in the full picture, we have also to integrate, uh, speaking about the aftermath of the first Mithridatic War, the very large bronze issues struck by mm -hmm. Smyrna, Rhodes, and, and, and others, for which we don't know the, the exact value, the, the, the nominal value, but it may, it, it much, it, it, it may be very uh, be, be, be <laughs> above <laughs> um, the, the metal value, of course. Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. I'm all in favor. So, I mean, I, I, am, uh, I am in favor of this. I do absolutely believe that the Mithridatic Wars, there is another article I wrote on this, uh, 
obviously comes up, comes out very soon, that actually talks about the impact of the Mithridatic Wars on all of the bronze denominations of Asia. And clearly there is an enormous uh, production regarding that. And you're right, uh, we don't know. And also, by the way, we know very well that, for example, just to say how right you are, for example, Francois, I'm in favor of it. For example, we know that Apamea, we have the same magistrates on bronze and on silver on, on the Sistofori, and we have the same spike in the same moment. We know Apamea, this enormous bronze uh, production that clearly has to do with Mitridatis. So really, it's... Um, yeah, there is much more to do. And personally, but this is, once again, I do believe, but we were talking here about silver. I do believe that the Dimitridatic Wars uh, are absolutely fundamental for the standardization of bronze coinage. I mean, really, it makes an enormous change after that. Also, the bronze coinage begin to circulate more widely. So we, you do have, Chad, it, it's enormous, the importance of Mr. But my problem, Chad, the thing I was discussing was not whether the Mithridatic Wars were absolutely a fundamental moment for the province of Asia and the monetary system. But my thing is that uh, who is uh, uh, the main agent uh, behind them. So my thing, of course, uh, the Romans are there, but are they paying for these coinages? No, of course, yeah. So there's, 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 there's one potential answer to Warren. Just before we finish, uh, let's, let's just quickly raise this, this interesting point that, uh, that, that Noah's dropped in, into the window yeah. about the, uh, the issue of Dios Heron. Um, thinking of this as a, a pseudo temple coinage would be interesting since perhaps the range of minting partners starts to expand. And I suppose that's that's another way in which we could see this dovetailing with some of the other silver issues that are being produced by civic entities um, in, yes. the, in, in, in the mid-second century. These, the, these, these coinages that are beginning to emphasize the, uh, the, the cult centers rather than the city itself, one might say. Is, is that what's going on here? Is that the sort of thing you were thinking about, Noah? I think you're still enabled. Yeah, I mean, to me, it makes uh, very, very much sense. Yes, absolutely. But now we have to to to, to wind this session up. We've we've reached the end. Um, uh, thank you, Lucia, um, for a fascinating uh, look at the um, uh, what's in store for us um, uh, when the uh, when, when the collection finally gets published and we can all get our teeth. Much into more, the, much more. That, that, that this is going to make to to the landscape. So, thank you. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.